wouldn't do anything radical like not, uh, not you know, wouldn't wave any flags. Like we hired a bunch of liberals to study the state and we know that liberals would come up with more money. You know, tax, 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 spend, 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 you've heard it. So we said, well, we'll hire a nice Republican outfit that doesn't tax, 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 spend, 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 and then all of the nice Republicans and the Democrats in the legislature will accept their evaluation of all the jobs in state government as truth, as opposed to some other thing. Didn't work. <laughs> it cost too much money. <laughs> but at any rate, the, we hired Arthur Young, and Arthur Young did set up a system. It's, it was a standard system. It's the same system that the Board of Regents set up in 1974, to evaluate all the jobs that the Board of Regents had under their uh, merit system at the time. It was that there was a questionnaire written, it was sent to all the, not all the employees, but a uh, representative number of employees in each class that filled out the questionnaire so that the consultant would know exactly what everybody did. Then there were evaluation teams composed of four people who looked at those questionnaires, who looked at the job descriptions that were already for those jobs, who also looked at the job standards and put a point count on, on each job in state government so that it could be par compared to every other job in state <laughs> government. And we used the four factors of skill, responsibility, effort, and working conditions, but we broke them down some more into 13 sub-factors so that we could measure uh, finite parts of each job. Now this is standard. Up to now, it's absolutely standard. The only difference from the region study of 74 and the one we did was we stuck a few extra questions into the questionnaire that implied something so that women would discover that they did dangerous things too. You know, previously, the jobs where you were going to find danger, which you pay for in working conditions, it was climbing tall buildings. Uh, cleaning windows on the outside, uh, digging trenches, you know, where it might collapse, all the kinds of things that have previously been related to men's work. We stuck in some things that nurses would respond to, like, do you work with infectious diseases? You know, piece of cake, huh? But they might get something. Uh, and, and I can't remember what else, but there were a lot of things. Oh, and lifting. Lifting before had been bricks and, and stuff that comes in wheelbarrows, mortar, you know, heavy things. Well, we gave librarians credit for lifting heavy books. You know, librarians pile books higher than some people do mortar, you know, and, and cement. And uh, we just put some questions in there that the women could figure out were work, bad working conditions. Well, that didn't, you know, that caused a lot of consternation because that wasn't ordinary. But anyhow, then we had these teams evaluate these jobs and get point counts, and then we had uh, a whole system worked out. We did regression analysis to find out a whole lots of things, did statistical work on it, and we came up with evaluations for all these jobs and found out that many women were underpaid, underpaid as much as six grades. You know, I don't know how many are familiar with the merit system, but there's grades and they go all the way down and all the way up. And it cost a lot of money to get there. And that's when we ran into trouble. When the governor saw how much money that it was going to cost, uh, uh, he wasn't quite so enthusiastic about comparable worth as he had been before. Plus the fact, by this time, the businesses in Des Moines, Iowa, who hire lots of women, discovered that if the state was going to pay clerical workers <coughs> more, that trickle-down theory that they know so well might trickle down to their employees, and they might want more money. And besides that, we didn't work market into the whole equation. Can you imagine having a pay system and not finding out what John Deere's pays for the same people so that you could set your salary? Because this is what the regions did in their 74 study. They went through this whole process, got everything on a nice even keel. Uh, they figured out that high level sectors were worth as much as uh, skilled trades. And then you know what they did? Instead of paying the same, they went out to the market and found out what they were making out of there and they juggled the wages. But they do have a pure point count system. There's no arguing with that. They just don't happen to pay for their points. 
Then they split up into different units so that nobody would notice that they were paying different for the points. Uh, but we were not going to let them do that in state government. It would have been simple had we let them do that. We didn't. And now it's costing $24 million to catch women and some underpaid grades that men dominate in up to so-called comp worth levels. Well, <clears throat> that's all. And, and we did appropriate $10 million earlier this year to do the first phase of those catch-up. And most of that money will go to jobs dominated by women. A lesser amount will go to those jobs that men dominate but that were undervalued according to our evaluation system. That was done in Senate File 2359. The governor did veto part of that, and I'm glad to respond to that in questions. I just want to take, make one partisan statement here that I think you can all handle because you're all grown up. Uh, as you know, I'm a Democrat. You might even know that I'm a very active one, that I like to think I have some influence in my party. I did go to the national convention this year, and uh, most of my Republican friends, who I get along very well with, did not go to their Republican convention. I'm talking about women who believe in comparable worth now. And in our Democratic platform, in San Francisco, we got written into our platform that the Democratic Party is on record as supporting both equal pay for equal work and equal pay for work of comparable worth. And we pledge to take every step, including enforcement of current law and amending the Constitution to include the unamended ERA to close the wage gap. But let me tell you what the Republicans did. Bless their hearts. I mean, you hear all the time how good President Reagan has been to women, right? He says it a lot. He even gave his daughter a good job. But you know what they did about comparable worth, pay equity? They put it in their platform that they were for equal pay for equal work, and I think that's progressive of them. 21 years it's been the law, and they put it in their platform. And then they went further and said, but we are opposed to this concept of equal pay for work of comparable worth or pay equity. They're opposed to it. And that is my closing partisan statement. <laughs> if you wish to withdraw my entire paycheck, I will split it with you, and we'll both get nothing. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I do, want to answer, I do want to answer questions, and uh, would you like to field them or should I? Go ahead. Well, I just, I guess because I'm an engineer, I want to pick up those statistics, but um, that's what well, well, Start over. I missed what you're... I'm going to be an engineer. Oh, okay, good. I didn't like your, what you're saying about engineering salaries. Of course, I don't want to say that's going to happen to me. But I think part of that pay discrepancy and, that, and those statistics should be accounted for and that those are the median incomes. And men haven't been in the engineering field a lot longer than women have. Do you think it accounts for beginning salaries of male and female engineers? Because they're well, they've got a discrepancy too. Well, from what I know of, about at least here at Iowa State, the, the pretty equitable pay. They look more at grade point and, and outside activities and stuff. Do you, have you looked at what happens after ten years in the engineering field of those I know same people? That's, that's, a, that's, that's what I didn't hear you. I know that it's bad that women don't get promoted as much as men. So, do you suppose that accounts for some of the pay discrepancy? Yeah. Okay. I know Okay. Uh, let me tell you something. If you want to believe what you believed right up until your last statement, <laughs> I'm not going to take it away from you. You know, if that gives you comfort, rejoice. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the one of the reasons that there are barriers to women in economic pay is exactly what you have just demonstrated. In order for us to feel good about ourselves, we have to help our oppressors come up with something we can buy. Otherwise, we're not whole. We're not good citizens because and we're, you know, there's something wrong with us. They pay us less. So then we help them figure out why we're paid less. It's sort of like being an abused wife. You know, we figure out why they abuse us because we didn't get the groceries on the table at the right hour, didn't keep the kids quiet, you know. Uh, it's, there's a little bit of that uh, in all of us in the job market. 
because we do not like to believe that we're not just as good as the fellows when we go to work, because we know we are. So we have to come up with something else, because we got to work. We absolutely have to work. But it leads us to poverty when we're old. I have a two-part question. Okay. Well, um, I'd, feel, I'd feel good if we had some uh, uniform method of accomplishing it. But it's not been written, and everybody wouldn't buy it, and it wouldn't apply to an engineering firm as well as a catering firm. Uh, there are different questions that need to be asked, different evaluations. I'd feel great if we had something. Now, the federal government has a system. And the federal government system, their job evaluation system, is used by many firms. As a matter of fact, Arthur Young tried to charge us thousands of dollars just to copy it, and fortunately we got their system and figured out that they'd only changed a few words, so we changed a few more words to make it a little different. Uh, and you bring up an interesting thing, too. When women weren't asking for comparable worth, there wasn't all this fuss about these systems being subjective. It was only when we wanted to apply the system, whatever it was, to men and women on the same, same scale that we got all this stuff from these economists saying you couldn't do it. See, we've had men over here with one evaluation system, women over here with another, and according to like this, you know. And then when we want to put them on the same, all we hear from personnel people, writers of these kinds of articles, economists, is you can't do it. So I'd feel good. Now, what was the second part of your question? I was just curious how many other states Oh, are there are about, there are 100 public jurisdictions, city, county, and state, that are working on it. Now, there's only about five states that have actually done anything. Minnesota, Iowa, um, California, Washington, of course, that's a very famous one. And then there's about five states that are in the process of being sued. Connecticut, city of Philadelphia, uh, on and on. We don't know how those suits are going to come out. As a matter of fact, there was a big conference just last week in Des Moines of uh, what we call ISAC. ISAC is Iowa, I can't remember the name. But anyhow, it's this county employee, county government people. They had a Des Moines lawyer speak to them. And that Des Moines lawyer said, don't worry about comparable worth, because if Reagan gets elected, they're going to do away with it. See, it's Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. I don't believe that but I am worried about his getting elected. Um, he also said, the reason he said that not to worry if Reagan gets elected, because he will appoint people to the Supreme Court who will do away with the interpretation that Title VII is a comparable worth law. So um, it's just terrible what's going on. You know, once women have discovered that they're worth something, worth a whole lot, it's kind of like when the minorities decided black was beautiful you know, there was a whole different attitude out there among black people. Well, now that women have decided that women are more than beautiful, we're competent, uh, there's a whole big backlash against paying us. And that's what's really going on now is a backlash. I have seen arguments by what I had thought were learned economists that sound like Phyllis Shafley when she was against the ERA. <laughs> they are do I say that the uh, e economists and the merchants the corporations are doing a Phyllis Shafley right now on comparable worth because they know it's going to cost them money. And for you men in the audience um, who are worried about if women get more money, you'll get less, um, I hope you're not really worried. But I understand that it's happening out there among some people. And the pie is only so large. But the Fair Labor Standards Law, the Equal Pay Law says that in order to raise one group of employees, you cannot cut the salaries of another group. Now, that's not written into Title VII. But I think when Terry Branstad wanted to cut men's wages in state government in order to get enough money to pay the women who were underpaid, I think that he would have been sued, and I think that he would have lost. Because that's not the way you make people whole. And that's what this whole thing is about is making women whole. They've been discriminated against. We found it in our studies. And to take it out of the checks of men 
does not make women whole. It makes both groups underpaid. So I don't think that's going to happen. And I, if you know any men that are worrying about it for that reason, I hope you, that you reassure them that the legislature will not let that happen, at least in state government. You had a question, yeah. That's true. And the reason they haven't yet gotten it in their paycheck is we gave the uh, executive the responsibility of figuring out when, if we implemented the Arthur Young study, just as uh, up to pay grade 34, no raises above 34, that they had to figure out how many pay periods prior to July 1st would $10 million cover. In other words, we gave them $10 million. They had to look at all the people in state government and, and figure out when $10 million would carry them from a pay period to July 1st with their new raises. In the bargaining unit, they decided it was March 8th to July 1st. But they only spent $6.6 .6 in that <coughs> agreement because the, that's what the comptroller said that the bill said. Well, there's really $10 million in there. And I think we're going to get an attorney general's opinion in a little bit telling us, yeah, Comptroller, if I gave you some information a couple of weeks ago that it was only 6.6, .6, I was wrong. It's really 10. So I think that that will start somewhere around February, whatever the first peri period in February or the last one in January. That's why you haven't seen it yet. Because we didn't fund it fully, and we knew that. Then the back and then you. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. It's not a very exciting study for anybody. <laughs> uh, because I don't think it costs any more to train a secretary than it does when somebody goes to the service or when somebody gets a promotion. You know, we know that it costs to train new people. And uh, I, I'm not aware of it. Is anyone else aware? I think there have been individual studies and individual factories and, and offices what it might cost. Uh, but they rarely offer that to a clerical to stay, that amount. And, you know, in the universities, not this year, not last year, not the year before, but in the good old days when we had money, they, when a professor got an offer from another school, three or 4,000 more, then we would match that and keep them. But that system's long gone, except for very rare instances. And that happens now, though, with men. But I don't know any women that can go in and say, I've got a better offer downtown, and then their boss says, well, I want to keep you, give you 1,000 more if you stay. So that's dang rare. <laughs> because they say, oh, I can train another secretary for nothing, because after all, you can. Secretary comes totally skilled, because our, our job requirements are that she can do that work before she starts. So it isn't such a big deal. But with uh, other jobs, we train them on the job, so it does cost us. Now you. It's a composite figure. Yeah. So that means that they figured up all the eighth grade graduates who were male. The Department of Labor is this is their figure. No. That's right. And they won't believe that either, so, <laughs> you know. <laughs> As a matter of fact, young women don't believe it. So but then I only use it for the drama of it. You know, imagine all the extra time women have put into an education and then end up with the eighth grade dropout male. But there are a lot of reasons for that, because men unionize, organize, uh, 
for most of laboring jobs, they start out at a salary and they don't get automatic increases, you know, six months in a year. It's that, it, the $5, the $10, whatever it is, is their wage until they negotiate a new contract. And they all get the same whether they've been on that job for 18 years or eight months. That's the labor's wage. So uh, it's different with clerical, you know. Eight years later, you get to the top, or six years later, you get to the top. You're now a fully formed creative secretary. Same time it takes you to get a medical degree, but you don't get paid <laughs> and that much. There's 30% from the bottom to the top in most merit systems. Anybody else? Go ahead. Now, I didn't say anything about not getting cut. Oh, yes, I did too. I did too. I'm sorry. It's not a matter yeah. of bringing the men down to the women's level. It's got to be bringing the men, women up. Bring up to the men. But where does that money come from? It comes from your taxes. Same place that you've been, the money you have been, that you've been paying us all along. Now, you want to know what taxes? Hmm. <laughs> well, it didn't go and come from any Republicans' vote because they're against raising taxes. So I don't know, where it, uh, you don't ask me where the money comes from to support this university, do you? Yeah, but see when I vote for something, you know, when I vote to give more money to schools, which we've done, we have increased our state appropriations to local schools now from like 15% of their total bill to 80% or 75. No one asked me where the money was coming from. It's only when we're going to give it to women have people ask me where the money's coming from. It seems then that the private sector might be even more opposed than state government because they see it coming out of their pocket. That's right. But they have something that state government doesn't have, which is to raise the price of their products or to get more efficient. Like they, when they give a man a jackhammer, he becomes more efficient in breaking up pavement. Whereas when you give a woman a typewriter that has a, a error erasing key, she can just do more work. She doesn't get more efficient. And therefore, there's not more profit in it. See, that when women are in service jobs, it isn't directly connected with the product. You know, if you type the letter, it's different than if you make the product on the line, because if you can make more products, then you make more money. But the fact that you type 100 more letters doesn't get you more uh, production in, on the profit line. It's, uh, it's a shame, but we can't really, for women's work, clerical in particular, you can't trace it to, to more production or profit. So um, I don't know where the money's coming from, um, but I, it, you know, we, when you are responding to illegal discrimination, which we are, then you do not say we can't afford it. Because that's never, in the Supreme Court of the United States, ever been allowed before for, in, for not ending dis discriminatory actions. It's never been, an, an, you know, when we freed the slaves, uh, that's what southern plantation owners are saying. We can't afford it to pay these people. And they fought a war about it. And it ended up costing them a whole lot more. And that's what's going to happen on, on women's wages too. And the, the reason we went ahead with this in state government is because we felt we were vulnerable to a lawsuit. And we felt if they brought a lawsuit against us and if they won, we not only would have to equalize wages on pay equity, but we would have to give them two years back pay. And that's what we were trying to avoid in state government. Now, you know, you've seen this, I'll get you next, this uh, figure about the Washington state case that kind of runs all the way from 600 million to 800 million to 1 billion. Only $75 million of that bill is for forward funding. The rest is back pay. Because their back pay goes back to 1976 or four, which is it, four? Yeah, because that's when they had their first study. If they had done as we did, 
try to take care of it before the lawsuit, and we did. The, the major union in the in state government has asked me, and we talked to their leaders, and they said, no, if you make a good faith effort to correct this, we will not sue. So they were sacrificing for their employees two years back pay. However, it would have been an expensive law firm for our law case for them and for the state, and it was better to work it out. Both sides felt that way. Now, if we backtrack you know, on the next phase, I don't know. We may still get a, a lawsuit. Now it's your turn. Our law is only for state government, right? Would, will that affect the industry, the higher employers, or will that happen Well, it might if you uh, go lobby your legislators to have a state comparable worth law that covers all of the employers in the state. But we only covered state in this one because that's all we felt for a few years we could enforce. Because, but the Title VII of the United States Civil Rights Act bans discrimination in pay on the basis of sex, age, not age, um, race, ethnic origin, religion, and a couple of other standard items. And that case in Washington State was one based on Title VII of the United States Civil Rights Law. Now that's being appealed to the federal district court, and if Whichever side loses there, the other side will appeal it to the United States Supreme Court, and they will then decide if Title VII actually does cover comparable worth. Now, they've had a couple of cases previously, one in 1978, which is the IUE Electrical Union versus General Electric, where they did find that the General Electric Company, was, after their own study, was paying women less than men, which was, which was not carrying out the equal comparable salary of their own employees. They also found that in Gunther, which they did say that you don't have to do the same jobs for Title VII to apply, but they didn't carry it under any further. They sent it back to the local level for them to work out. So they do, you know, we feel that there is a beginning that it probably does cover it, but it, there again, there again, if we get these three can, two or three people on the Supreme Court to feel otherwise, it'll all be out the window. So are you saying that if, if the Supreme Court would rule favor, favorably in the Washington suit, that that would make way for all the other states to... That would, that's for public and private employment. The same factories and corporations that are covered by the Fair, Fair Labor Standards Act, you have to have so many employees and so much gross uh, in order to be covered by that. So. You bet. If they find, see, the, the district court, the state of Washington, found overt discrimination on the part of the state of Washington, if that goes and carries all the way up, then we don't need any law changes. But many of the congressmen, Democratic and Republican, fewer Republicans that are running now, are saying, if Title VII doesn't cover this discrimination, we're going to change the law and see that it does. Mm -hmm. So. If we can keep their feet to the fire, we've got a chance someday to get paid what men get paid. And many men are underpaid, you know. He's talking about the minute power plant. The what? And hourly wage. The what was I talking about? He's talking about the minute power plant and the secretaries. Oh. Were the minute plant under a contract or an hourly wage? Uh, the power plant people, I think, are under contract, right, Pat? I don't know what I'm not. Oh, oh, I, I, the physical plant, the physical plant. Uh, they're both under contract. They do not, they're neither of them, as I understand it, are affiliated with the National Union, but they have their own bargaining unit. They're both under contract. Pat? What is it, for heaven's sakes? See, every time I've met and I get together, we're always working together. <laughs> <laughs> Pat, Pat, Pat was... I have a chance to watch her work, but I just want you to know that 
This woman here is really the mother of comparable worth in the state of Iowa. Mm. And it wasn't for her place here. I want you, you to know that I didn't interrupt my working career for that birth. <laughs> Thank you, they're lovely. Pat O'Shea, who's just gone to the back of the room, is with the International Asthma Union and was on the Interim Comparable Worth Committee also. Go ahead. You mean without your skills atrophying, you mean? <laughs> I absolutely agree with you. Um, I, my work life was interrupted. Frankly, I think I was a more valuable employee when I went back to work for the experiences that I went through those years I was out. And, uh, you know, it's just plain maturity that happens. And you are a better employee, I think, when you're more mature and can handle more situations. But that's not the way the economic world, see, Having babies is a barrier to economic advancement for women, not for men. <laughs> Try to sell it. Try to sell it. I'm all for you. <laughs> I don't think the president of General Motors cares much. <laughs> Well, that's my point. What we have to do for those 20 occupations is find out what they really are worth to the employee. We don't find out what the market pays for them, but we find out what they're worth, and then we pay them according to that. And once they start paying women who are clustered into those 20 occupations what those jobs are actually worth, then they're going to say, well, as long as I've got to pay them anyway, I might as well let them do these other things. But the reason women don't apply for firefighters and they don't apply for a lot of these things that men dominate in is because they can't get hired. You know, they, that sounds terrible in, in today's world, but you just don't get called because they don't hire women. Now, they've all gotten smart. They don't say, I don't hire women. They no longer ask you if you intend to get married and have babies, which they used to do. They used to do that even in clerical jobs, uh, but they simply never get called, or if they do, they get their token. Put it right out there in the front office where everybody can see, ah, we got one woman engineer. Just like we got one woman astronaut walking around up there right now. One. Well, she's the second one. But when did that start? How many years ago? How many years ago was John Glenn an astronaut? Does anybody know? 1963? Okay. When John Glenn went into it, there was a woman who wanted to be an astronaut. She was told at that time, I've forgotten her name, she, she now flies a cargo in Africa. She was told she wasn't eligible. She could never make the grade. They didn't let them in. So 20 years later, they have some they've let in. And what's more, they found them to be very valuable. Go ahead back there. I'm not quite sure I understand the position of talking more in terms of philosophy behind it. Now my question is, I can understand practical politics why you wouldn't want to lower men and raise women, but I can't understand why you Oh, okay. I, I don't want to. I, I don't want to cut their wages. I do believe in freezing them until these other jobs catch up. I do believe in that. Yes, I understand that. My question is, why do you believe that? Well, because I don't think the men are overpaid. Okay. I don't know any in state government that we have looked at that are overpaid. Now, there's probably some people in state government that are overpaid, but they're not in this state merit system. I mean, we got a lot of men who, with the size of their families, are eligible for free cheese. They really are. And there's some others that are eligible for food stamps because of the size of their families. So I don't think those people are over, under, overpaid at all. But in order to get men and women's jobs on the same keel, we have to hold these while these go up, or I should say here, while they come up. Then when they all get to the same level, then they can move up together. Otherwise, you don't have comparable worth. You're absolutely right. 
Um, we do that now in state government. When they have a reevaluation under the present merit system, they freeze jobs for two years if they think they're overvalued. So, you know, nothing works perfectly. I think an interesting phenomenon that has occurred every time equality of pay, whether it's equal pay or comparable work, has occurred, but a very dangerous lullaby is the phrase, ah, but you are the highest paid woman in this office, mm -hmm. or you are the highest paid technician in this lab, or you're the highest paid secretary in the whole department. And I have watched time and time again um, women get lullabies by that. And I, I think they also abandon their sisters when they find out they're better I off. Think, I think we need to keep that in mind. It has happened every time mm -hmm. this has occurred in the last 12 to 15 years and in every state. Is that called the Queen Bee Syndrome? <laughs> Not exactly. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, but why, why are you complaining? You are the highest, do you realize you are the highest paid mm -hmm. woman in, you know, whatever it happens to be? <laughs> well, I just hope that all of you will work hard to, to be informed on this issue, and then when the people come around and say things like that to you, or say to you that you're lucky to have a job, or that there's a hundred people out there waiting to take your job, that you'll stick together. You'll stick together. Uh, a whole bunch of years ago, I took labor economics, and my professor said that workers are just like bananas. You get away from the bunch and you get skinned. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Did Johnny Hammond ever get back so we can introduce her? Now, Johnny, this is the colleague I was trying to introduce an hour and a half ago. Stand up. Johnny helped on comparable worth. Take your troubles to her. <laughs> I want to remind everyone that Representative oh, Douglas will be at Lucalon also to watch the Vice President's debate. Thank you, Governor Town, over the stage. If you're watching it, it's a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, I'm just starting out right now. And so I'm doing just some basic. I got a file at the. <laughs> <laughs> I got biographies all over the place. Glad to let you use my library. Okay, if you want to come down. So, so, I will be so I could just be able to get a, in touch with you down there. Yeah, I'm in the